So next up, we have one of our favourite podcast guests. I guess they all are, aren't they? But uh, Dr. Sally Bell. She's been on the podcast twice um, already before, and I will add her on now. Hey. Hello. How are you doing? No, all right, thank you. Yeah. Good, 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 good. Really um, enjoyed listening to some of your guests. Patrick was amazing. So, I know, yeah. I know. I feel like with Patrick, you need about three hours to yeah. go through. Just <laughs> amazing. Um, <laughs> it, 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 you know, it's going to be the same with you. Like when we, we get these experts on like yourself and you all know so much, it's like, one you you ask one little question it's like well it can go here here, here. we can <laughs> we can go everywhere with it um and uh yeah no it's uh yeah no it's fascinating it's good to i'm glad to yeah. you enjoyed it as well it's interesting hearing you having used some of that with like ask yeah. patient and then the new stuff he was talking about with the female um population but um let's uh let's let's this is this is your time this is your time you, <laughs> you, you've been one of the only uh, um I don't know if we had, I don't know if we said before whether we've had, you've been on the podcast twice. Yeah. Um, and I don't know that we'd had anyone back yet before. So uh, it was, a, you're in, uh, you're one of our very, very special guests. And so thank you so much for taking the time to join us, um, you know, on a Sunday for the podcast live event. It wouldn't have been um, complete without, we were bringing together our best guests of the podcast. It wouldn't have been complete without you in the running order. Um, we had so much, um, so much amazing feedback and questions following the first um, uh, interview that we did with you, that we had the follow-up one and then it, and it, you know, and it just continued. Um, I think that one of the great things about those conversations is the breadth and depth of it in that we are, we're, talk, we're not just talking of like nutrition is just one of these five foundations that you, um, that you talk about. And I'm sure we'll get a number of, nutritional questions um as we go through this i want to make this as interactive with the people watching um as possible but for for just to set the tone um just a quick intro um of dr sally bell what is who is dr sally bell functional functional health in a nutshell and um and then those and those five and those five um foundations yeah yeah, I'll so in a comment of what we are. Okay, so um, I mean, my background is I've uh, been in medicine, conventional medicine, for twenty-one years, and um, I trained in general practice. And I think even during my training in general practice, I started having issues with the way we were trained, where there was this big focus on seeing somebody getting their disease um, sort of categorised into a classification. Uh, yeah. And then followed the guidelines um, for, for treating that disease. And I yeah. would be really frustrated that we weren't focusing on a person. We were focusing on a disease. And I think I was frustrated that it would assume that everybody's disease had the same root cause. Um, and then I went away to Africa for a few years, worked overseas for an aid agency. And when I came back to general practice, a whole host of other things that happened there'd been this massive drive to sort of um, create guidelines for everything. And instead of guiding us as physicians, it was more law. Like you, you dared and step off and use yeah. your brain or your intuition. And, and then a lot of the guidelines were very pharmaceutically driven. Um, so there was a lot of prescribing that I was doing that I was becoming really uncomfortable with. And I think the other thing, like in general practice, you know, here in the UK, we used to hold the whole family together. We would know you, we would know your dad, we would know your siblings, we'd know your situation. I'd say, I'll see you in two weeks about that other thing. And that broke down. And uh, so I came back in 2009, I was seeing 40 patients a day, 10 minutes, you know, each they were sick of telling me their story to another doctor. I was just wanting to get them out of the room, you know, with the prescription. And, um, and then what happened is I actually lost my own health and uh, went through the system and came out with my diagnoses and got given drugs and, uh, and, uh, and kept thinking to myself, but you're not telling me why I'm unwell. And, um, and I had this moment with my neurologist where I said, is there anything I can do to get myself better? And he just slipped another prescription across the desk and said, Sally, try this. And it was the breaking point for me where I went, no, like, there has to be more. And so I stepped back. I went back to the books. I discovered a whole host of other physicians asking the same questions. 
And really sort of functional health is about looking upstream. Instead of treating a disease, it's about looking at your body and, and working out what's going on in your body and where it's gone wrong. Because as you go upstream and you correct things there, then a whole host of things gets better. And also it appreciates that the body isn't just, you know, if you have a problem with the liver, it's from the liver. If it's your skin, it's your skin. If it's your gut, it's your gut. It actually understands that we um, are an interconnected sort of uh, web of uh, relationships within our body. And that if you pin the web there, it can affect it here, there. Yes. And, and so it's a lot more, you know, um, integrated in terms of its approach. And so I did some training and um, I, I recovered my health very quickly myself started practicing on uh, lots of people who any, anybody let me have a go and, and I started seeing things get better that I got taught you could never get better you know autoimmune diseases and thyroid issues and my mum got diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis she didn't want to go down the medication route very unwell and within weeks we had her better and not on any medication and three years on she is still better so bringing you know coming forward five years like um i've developed a framework that i use so when you look at chronic disease which is a big thing that we're facing as a nation that's crippling us and robbing us of, of you know enjoying life you know uh, chronic disease like 90 percent of it is lifestyle so we are still looking for a pharmaceutical um, uh, solution, but a lifestyle problem requires a lifestyle solution. And so I talk about five foundations that underpin health. I talk about sleep, movement, rest, nutrition, and connection. So connection with self, connection with others, and a connection with that sense of just, purpose. Just name, just name those five again. Yeah, so sleep, rest, connection, yeah. nutrition, and movement um, being the five foundations. And this beautiful science. Like when I trained in the 90s, the science wasn't there, even in nutrition. And, um, and certainly as medics, we get taught no nutrition, which is just yeah. barbaric. I just can't get my head around yeah. that. Um, and so, and I use that as a simple framework because actually I'm a bit of a bottleneck in terms of reaching people and getting people better. I work a lot with health coaches now, but actually there's a whole host of stuff that we can do as individuals that can turn the tide of, of chronic disease. And that's my passion. I get up every day because I really believe we've found something that can help turn the tide of chronic disease. And I know. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Well, sure. Can we, can we unpack those five foundations, um, a little bit more maybe one at a time and just to um, encourage people if you have um, specific questions um, ask those in the comments the whole point of um, the podcast live is that rather than it just being myself and Tim on the podcast asking the guests the questions that you get to interact and ask those questions yourself so um, those five um, rest movement, movement nutrition sleep, sleep. nutrition and connection and connection so yeah. you got any questions about using those to optimize your yourself your body um then ask them uh, ask put those in the comments we'll unpick um each of those as we go uh, and as we go through and then we'll pick up it'll be my job to uh, try and keep an eye on all of the uh, <laughs> all the comments um, there's a lot of people were were we're signing in and waving because they're enjoying um, seeing you um, onto the podcast. But if you have specific questions for Sally, um, well, make sure you stick those in the comments and we will answer them as we go. Um, yeah. Oh, there you go. Here's, that was a good, that, yeah. This is what I was going to ask. This is what I <laughs> which is the most important one. And the answer yeah. is, always, they're yeah, all important. Or oh, the right one yeah. for you. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating. I think one of the things we need to get fundamentally in our head is that our body is wired to heal. Like, and, and, the, and disease is a process. Like, um, and we, the, your red light rising guy used the word epigenetics. And, and this is like, we used to think it was all about our genes. If we knew our genetic code, we would crack it. But now we understand there's this thing called epigenetics, which is the kind of software around our genetics. And we know that we can manipulate that by the decisions that we make about how we interact, about how we eat. And, and actually our food is speaking to our genes. And I mean, it's just phenomenal. And so I think like the first thing, you know, we need to understand is that we're wired to heal. And two, that we have control to manipulate our epigenetics and our health. 
And that disease is process. Like a lot of people seem to think their diabetes or their cancer falls out of the sky on their lap. And it doesn't. A whole host of things, small daily decisions, take people either towards, you know, disease or towards, you know, living wholehearted lives where they feel well. And so we have the ability to control that. And so before we think about well, what's the best foundation to start working on, um, you know, we, we have to understand that we do have control and that we, we don't have to sort of abdicate responsibility to the physician or to the pharmacy, you know, pharmaceutical industry to come up with some cure for things. There is so much that we can do. And I think probably, I think often with a lot of my patients, if, I, if I'm unclear where to start, if all of their foundations are just all over the place, I will probably start with sleep. Um, because you know we know that on the whole, as a nation, we are sleeping like 25% less than we did 50 years ago. We know that the majority of those between 18 and sort of 30 are getting six hours or less every night. And we know it has catastrophic effects on every single aspect of our health, whether it's our productivity, our creativity, our ability to fight cancer, our ability to fight infection, our heart disease risk, our athletic performance, our, our mental health. Like there isn't a, a bit of our body that sleep doesn't touch and and so really sometimes and you know like weight loss i have a lot of people coming for for weight loss issues and obesity like you cannot lose weight if you're sleep deprived like your whole hormones go awry and you your your appetite goes up and your insulin resistance goes up and um, your your hunger goes up and and so so really starting with getting really fantastic sleep which means prioritizing it um and then there's a whole host of things we can do um, called sleep hygiene that can yeah. help us get really good. I was going to say, you're going, to, you're going to list, give people an example of a few of those, and then we'll get onto some of these questions from Alfie B. Page and yeah, yeah, here, sure. yeah, yeah, sleep yeah. First of all, like you need between seven and a half and nine hours sleep. So, and that's asleep. That's not in bed. So, first of all, it's life becomes very inconvenient when you take sleep seriously like you have to turn off not netflix you have to come off your phone you know so Same some way, money when you sleep because <laughs> money when you're sleeping you you get rid of you you get rid of those netflix yeah so um so first of all for some people it's just prioritizing it there's no more magic than that if you're like me i really struggle to get good sleep and so there's a number of things that you can do. And, and, and um, this is actually captured on my website. I've got a little free cheat sheet that you can go look under my resource section if people want to pick up later. That's sallybell.co.uk. That's sallybell.com. Sally .com. Sally .com, yeah. Um, and so things like routine. So your body has, is, is controlled by a whole host of clocks and it loves routine. Routine and how we eat and how we sleep. So creating a routine around bedtimes and getting up every day can be really, really helpful. Um, the other thing is, the next thing would be caffeine. So um, you have something called a sleep urge um, that develops. There's this thing, this little molecule called adenosine, and it, and it builds up through the day, and it, and it sort of communicates to your brain as it gets to a certain point that it's time to sleep. But caffeine sits on those receptors in our brain. We can't hear it. And caffeine could sit in our body for six, sometimes 12 hours, depending yeah, on how... the half-life of caffeine. Is. Yeah, yeah. And it depends how you detox, you know, and a lot of people don't have enough to detoxify properly anyway. So getting caffeine out of your diet or bringing it down before sort of midday, I think is really helpful. Um, so... Uh, so you, would, you would, if someone's struggling with sleep after midday, try to... Re to, to I have don't have any caffeine. After if you could go caffeine free, I would go caffeine free. But sometimes yeah. caffeine's a beautiful thing. That cup of coffee in the morning, yeah. that's my little moment. <laughs> yeah. It's my also understanding time. what things like what has caffeine, like which some yeah. you know, sometimes the misconceptions that it's like cafe okay, coffee, and then yeah. we don't think about tea, and we don't think about dark chocolate, and we don't think about yeah. even green dark tea. Green tea, yeah. yeah. I always have my healthy ones going, Oh, I've got to have green tea in the evening. Yeah. It's like, no, yeah. that's got caffeine in too. So yeah. yeah, as you've mentioned, all of those things, chocolate has caffeine in too. Is there any other what is there any other obvious ones I've missed? I mean pop, you've got to think, you know, so okay, you know, like, yeah, if you're thinking Coca Cola then yeah. you've got bigger yeah. problems. Yeah. <laughs> um so, drink Coca Cola, people. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, so routine and getting caffeine out of your diet. Then the next thing um, is light. So again, we 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 are created and we have had an, had a rela relationship with life for light for thousands of years, and our body has adapted and responds to it. And we have different spectrums of light. And, uh, and it's the blue light that you get very strong in the morning. And it's the blue light that you get from your phones and, and from our LED lighting that tells our body um, that it's daytime and it suppresses a hormone called melatonin, which yeah. you want melatonin suppressed in the morning. So get out in the morning um, and then, um, you know, avoiding screens, low lighting. You know, I have a little... Um, in the winter, I have a little routine where I'll go around to my kids' rooms. I put low lighting on, I draw the blinds and just, you know, I create the evening and, and get our body set to kind of getting yeah. um, that blue light out of our body. You can use blue block, blue block of glasses you can buy on the internet. I use those if I've got to work or how, I'm doing... How effective, like, how effective are they? Are they, is that... I don't like, know how to measure that, Daco. Yeah, um, I'm interested. I've I've got a pair, but I've not really. Yeah, like I sort of think that there's other benefits to getting off my computer and my phone after whatever time at night. From a getting my brain to slow down and get ready yeah. for rather yeah. than just the the blue yeah. light. We've got um we've got one of the red the target red lights from Red Light Rising yeah. in our bedroom, so. Uh, we don't have a normal. There's only there's only red light, which doesn't affect the. the I'd love to know what your neighbours think your bedroom set up as. Yes, yeah, it's just <laughs> With red. With red light poking through the curtains. Just red. <laughs> we tape our mouths and we go to bed. That's all that happens in there. <laughs> oh dear. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, so light, yeah. yeah. And actually that goes on to my next point, that thing about how busy our heads are. Like, yeah. Otherwise um, my brain, otherwise I'm awake at three o'clock in the morning yeah, yeah, and yeah. my brain is just thinking. It's like having yeah. great ideas that are yeah. all not about sleeping. Yeah, and I think we, one of the things we've just lost the art of is actually preparing to sleep. Like we kind of go, 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 go. And then our head hits the pillow and our brain suddenly goes, right, I have some processing to do. Yeah, and you've yeah. got no time to kind of have a daydream and sort all this out. And then, it, you know, our, our heads get really busy. So preparing to sleep. And I'm then reading finally, book, I'm reading a book um, called... About Rest, silence. With me, um, called Rest. And yeah. it talks about the, brain, like the measuring brain activity. Of where basically, when you're daydreaming... Like this, like it, you're you're doing as much. Your brain's working just as much as when you're like doing a really difficult task. Yeah. And that there's some, you know, some benefits of doing some really mundane tasks, yeah. like help you like process loads of things and do some problem solving yeah. and like go but like that. Yeah. Having that time out to do that, letting as part of our being um, like deliberate about having some. Absolutely, and if you're letting, a creative. If, if we never do that, I think that's when I get yeah. to that point at night where it's like, okay, yeah. we'll do all this now. And then it's like, yeah. a, you can't sleep. Or I will fall to sleep. That's never been a problem. It's that I'll wake up in the middle of yeah. the night and that yeah. I won't be able to get back to sleep. That's my problem. And that early morning waking tends to be to do with cortisol levels. So to do with your stress levels. Um, yeah. And so again, like, you know, going through all those sleep hygiene things, we have to be aggressively like dealing with stress in our life. Because if we haven't, yeah. again, your cortisol should be the highest in the morning, like that gets you going. And then through the day, it should be like dropping, 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 dropping. But if, you know, we're stressed about work deadlines, we're still on our computers, we're watching movies that are releasing stress, we're eating inflammatory foods that stresses out. We're arguing with our spouses, we're fed up with the dog, whatever it is, like yeah. that pushes our cortisol up. And that's when you get that early morning waking. Because because really the whole point of the stress response is to keep you awake and hyper alert yeah. so that you can perform. Yeah. Um, and if we don't yeah. get that stress down, then then you get that early morning awakening. Or for some people, they get that early morning awakening because they're hungry and actually having a kind of, you know, something that's just got a sort of low GI kind of um, food to help through the night can really help as well. You, know, okay. you need to play a little bit with that if you don't think it's yeah. stress. So, well, we've got, we've got uh, I think for me, it's stress. Um, and it just made, we've got a question about before eating before bed. So we'll answer that in a second. Just on, on that, it, we're... We, we live that lifestyle that, and you can have literally no rest during the day and it's just like, go, 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 fight or flight, fight or flight, fight or flight all day long. And we get to the end of the day and we're tired and we're like, let's go. To, and it's like, 
right, we're going to sleep now. And what you've just described, what was running through my head then, what you were describing, I was like, we're just not being fair to ourselves mm -hmm. because then mm -hmm. we're like, we're wanting ourselves to switch off and sleep. We haven't set ourselves up to do that. Like, it's actually, it's not fair on ourselves. Yeah. Um, I think we've talked about that before on a, a the pet podcast. It's around creating rhythms in our life that sustain yeah. us. And, and we just, you know, we cannot, modern day diseases because of our modern day living, and we cannot just expect an, a quick solution. Yeah. They, yeah, uh, keep doing the same thing and expect a different outcome. And there is an, a need for a kind of revolution about how we do life and creating rhythms that sustain us and bring us joy and bring us life. And um, yeah, daily rhythms, weekly rhythms, you know, so, and working out what you need in order to feel good and rest. Yeah. Um, I'll not necessarily, I'll try and go through these in the order, in a, an order that depending on what we're talking about. So we will get to everyone's question, but um, Ranato Pascio PP, if that's it, uh because we we're talking about sleep how long mm. before sleeping should we have our last meal or snack and if we maybe if we frame that in the context because you've given that context of like if you're getting that early morning awakening that there could be something there but if we go <laughs> for a general thing around like di i'm thinking digestive health giving your yeah. body enough time to digest so that yeah. then it can, can sleep what yeah. would be the yeah, so I, I'm a real passionate believer in um, time restricted eating. And I think the evidence around that is just phenomenal in terms of our body. And I think we're now understanding um, that our body, is, you know, we know that our cl there's clocks around sleep and stress, but we're also starting to understand that actually even our liver and our digestive enzymes and our gut are also on a clock and that we can really maximize health by eating at, at the way we're designed to do um, and so um and time restricted eating for those that aren't aware is just you know for some people that might be 12 hours so they only eat between eight o'clock in the morning and eight o'clock at night for me it really works that i eat from midday and i eat till about eight o'clock and i stop and and so it's finding something that works for you um, but this grazing from seven o'clock in the morning to ten o'clock at the night just isn't great for us and uh, and we need to again just play with and create a rhythm where we start retracting that um, the times that we eat it's great for weight loss reversing obesity diabetes i mean it's, it's just it's just a beautiful thing yeah. um, and that's because having, I've got my... that, 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 like around having some time where you're allowing your digestive tract yeah. to do its job yeah. um, rather than just keeping putting stuff in and it never yeah. had time yeah. to yeah. Um, your t time is that a, is it is that another name for intermittent fasting or is intermittent fasting separate? Yes, no, intermittent fasting, any form of fasting is a great yeah. benefit. So intermittent fasting and time restricted eating are, are similar terms in the sort of medical world. And, and yes, our gut needs time to do everything else because we now know that we have this whole host of, uh, you know, bacteria there doing incredible yeah. jobs for us. And a huge part of our immunity, our happy hormones are made in our gut are all found there. And so our gut has some other stuff to do. And, yeah. uh, and so actually, you know, yeah, it, we need to eat, but we don't need to be eating all the time. And we release our body to do a whole host of other things. But in terms of when to eat late at night, like I would avoid, like you don't want to be digesting when you're asleep, really, like a big heavy meal. Because again, like sleep, it's a, it's a phenomenally active um, yeah. a phase, you know, during our 24 hour cycle that there's lots of stuff that needs to be doing. And, and so I would go very light snack if you're going to snack late at night, um, but still bear in mind to try and fit that within your time restricted eating um, pattern. And, and if you're having you never done time restricted eating, literally just take a couple of hours off one day. That's it. And just see how that feels and, and realizing that you are not going to die if you don't eat, which is a huge amount of anxiety, you know, around our relationship with food, you know, and just trying that and then gradually building that up. And, you, you know, you will see the benefits. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah. we, you know, you've mentioned this a number of times when we've spoken before on, on the podcast that and you mentioned it there, like figuring out what works for you as an individual um, yeah. is important, you know. I, I've done stuff where um, I can feel really, like, particularly like related, a lot of my stuff is like, how, how do I feel and how's that like when I'm training? And it can be, 
I can train fasted and feel amazing, but there's a consequence to that fasting for me that then delivers an overeating later in the day. Mm -hmm. um, and then I play this like catch up afterwards and I go from like, I've, I'm having to, I'm having to understand that like, there's quite a, there's, what I'm trying to say is that like, I can do something that on that one, uh, for a period of that day, then I feel good. But the consequence of that later in that day and then the following day actually yeah. makes the whole experience a little bit negative for me. And I have to be okay. careful around like mm -hmm. whether I, wh how I, how I'm still figuring that out, I guess, yeah. a little bit. But what I'm starting to understand is I know that when I, if I fast for too long, even though I can do it and it makes me feel good in that small instance, yeah. it can then have repercussions later for me yeah. where I need to make sure I get that balance. And um, I, I, I'm trying to encourage people to yeah. try and... Yeah, yeah, listen to your body and find out what's yeah. working well for you. And a big part of some of the stuff I practice when in the connection piece, um, like people, they're really mad about the nutrition and, you know, dealing with their stress and sleep. But actually, we know that if we're disconnected from ourselves, disconnected from others and disconnected right. from that sense of purpose it has a it's a massive driver for disease and and a big part of um my work with people is getting them to listen to themselves like actually what you need to do jacko is listen like and 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 respect that and tune in to what you intuitively probably know and what your body yeah. needs um and, and and having some kindness around that yeah. um so well, we, have to take, we have to take some time to, to to take a step back in our busy life and actually give ourselves a little bit of time to, to, to process that, take that on board and like then think about it and say, I can then apply it afterwards. If yeah. we if we just keep running, yeah. you know, we don't actually ever really do, yeah. like, it's, it, like you said, you probably know the answer yourself intuitively, yeah. but you don't get to, to act on that intuition yeah. if you don't take that little bit of like, time out and I think that's yeah that hit me because today I've had that conversation now with three different guests <laughs> like the same even though all from completely different areas of like health wellness and fitness but like the yeah. same themes come back around yeah yeah and and I think probably culturally we're just taught to look to the institution for the answers look to the government for the answers look for religion for the answers you know constantly looking outside of ourselves and I think we're we're raised and I think especially as women to not trust our intuition and not trust you know our inner voice and I and part of I think wholeness is 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 being really comfortable in your own skin and comfortable with your own voice and and trusting that deep intuition within us and and for me that's like full health it's mar it's sort of that marriage between our physical our emotional spiritual sort of health and and bringing that all together and that's when we find fullness of life and and we start really um yeah being comfortable with who we are and and, and enjoying life and I, and I think that's really the definition of health isn't it that enjoyment of life yeah. um, and sometimes that pursuit of nutrition and training and, and it's just a distraction from the fact that yeah. we're lonely and disconnected and yeah. we need to ask some deeper questions which is part of that of, you know becoming healthy yeah well it's part of this there's uh, Alfie B Page that's a great question whilst we're talking about connection um in regards to connection, does um, does it need lots? To, do, does that need to be lots of different people or a small group of people? Okay, and at the moment with lockdown, do mm. virtual meetings fit the bill? Okay. I imagine it's the level of connection. Is that more important? Yeah. The quality? Yeah, I think um, I think we're all wired differently, and so for me personally, like I'm deeply introverted. If you put me in a room with loads of people I just shrink and I think oh gosh what am I going to say you put me around a table with two or three and I feel deeply connected and and so I think but for some other people actually they get energy and from being in that big group and they bounce off each other and what have you so it is a little bit about understanding how you're wired and and and, and the social isolation thing just kills me like I don't think we can have that level of connection, you know, without being in the same room. Like there is even science about what, um, what happens when you're in the same room as somebody. Like I can draw you into my heart rate and I can draw you into my breath rate just by yeah. 
focused attention and, and I can bring you into my peace if you're if you're distressed and, yeah. and I'm not sure that can happen like this and yeah. then there's just the whole science around touch I mean it's a beautiful beautiful stress yeah. reliever and it grieves me like some of these guys that are single and are living alone at home just I just find that really hard and uh, I certainly find it really hard in my own life and I've got my kids and husband at home um, not being able to kind of you know wrap my arms around my friends and you know, we've had a couple of friends that have died this last month and it's just so hard to grieve as a community when you when you're separate like this um yeah. it's such a violation of our of, of our humanity yeah, <laughs> yeah. Driving me nuts. one of the things that really um struck me the most about that the connection side of things was that there is you know now as people are delving into a, a more and more research about these things some of the stuff that i'd heard um on my wife's functional health coach courses doing like overhearing things where they're talking about there's some real like the evidence of what that the difference that that connection can make to like your health yes it's yeah. not just like it's not just like we know that it's good to have the like some close-knit friends that you can rely on for like, everyone agrees on that but there's like there's deeper stuff like you, even just then you're saying when you were with someone you can your heart rates and then can't isn't there like um females living together they're like hormone cycles can like yeah, yeah. join up like yeah. there's stuff going on that we that don't is far deeper um yeah. potentially yeah. still don't fully understand yeah. but there's yeah. i just love those ideas about there's yeah. so much other stuff going on absolutely and, and there's some work also like um slavovich um done some work on the stress lab, lab over in america and he I and mean, he's got some wonderful work that shows, you know, physically how social isolation drives inflammation. And we know inflammation is yes. the process in our body. And, and, it's, and it's one of the underlying mechanisms of nearly all chronic disease, you know, whether that's heart disease, cancer, diabetes, it, there's this overinflammation in our body. And, and he's shown that, you know, social isolation drives that disease. So again, it's not this kind of fluffy oh yeah we'd often, we'd often think it's just that was just the, what you're eating like we know like oh, okay what you're eating that can that can cause inflammation but to think that it's just yeah. opening up the conversation of people's ideas that there's, there's other so it goes back to what you said right at the beginning we are we are one we are a whole being and that is everything like about us our thoughts our minds our yeah. clock, our hat, like all of those things um they're interconnected yeah yeah um, whilst we're talking about nutrition, then there was two. I'm going to ask one shorter one first, and then a longer one. Uh, Loz lifts Loz, um, which uh, she's been to a number of our. Uh, she's been to yeah. every. She's been. To, um, she's been to every single um, retreat that we've uh, we've ever done. Um, so big shout out to her. But um, are ground or dried versions of things like turmeric as good as the fresh raw product? Um. And so I'm going to throw in there, like she said, she said turmeric yeah. because she knows the, the benefits of it, but yeah. throw out the chuck into the mix the benefits of turmeric as well. Uh, so, I mean, turmeric, like, um, is curcumin, which is the active part in turmeric. And, um, and there, there's studies kind of at, you know, sort of cellular level and animal levels that show that it has anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer um, effects. Um, it's never been translated to humans, not because the research has been done and it's disproved. It's just um, it's just not been done. So right. um, and when you look at kind of the levels that they use um, in animals and you were to multiply that up to what a human might need, if you're just doing per kg, you need a, a lot of curcumin in order to have that same effect. Right. And so it's difficult to translate um, at the moment, those animal studies to human studies. However, I would say, like, if again you look at ancient cultures, turmeric has been a huge part of healing in a lot of those cultures. And I think, you know, a lot of these practices, we're now sort of understanding the science. I know there is a study that looks at supplements compared to eating turmeric and its anti inflammatory effect, and that um, actually it's in the cooking of turmeric that something happens and it's more potent if you're eating it than you're taking a supplement. So Did that doesn't cook, answer. You it. Did you say if you're cooking it? Cooking with it, yes. Cooking with it is better than taking a supplement of it. As in, um, so, what about eating it raw, like in a shake? Oh, I, I don't know. 
I don't know that question. I don't know the answer. So I, I know of those studies. So there's definitely something about consuming it in your diet compared to taking a supplement. I was just interested um, in the, when you said cooking, mm, does something happen? Is there something yeah. part of that, like heating process yeah. to break it yes. down? Yes, and it may be. We don't, we don't know. And um, and so, so yeah, I, I have it as part of my diet. And certainly, like, if I'm doing something, immune thing I'll, sh I'll shove it in a shake yeah just <laughs> always sit up and get a good dose and um and there's lots of lovely foods that we know have very anti-inflammatory effects anti-cancer effects um yeah so so yeah so what is it um how, just what are those some of those things like I mean, garlic garlic has a lot more human studies in terms of its antibacterial antiviral properties um, and you look at resveratrol, which is the, the, the um, flavonoid found in grape skin, so in red wine. Um, again, like resveratrol has incredible anti-cancer effects, but again, that's in animal studies, and I don't think yet they've translated that to kind of human studies. And I, I think you have to drink about 2,000 glasses of wine to get the dose that the animal's got. It's probably not a solution. You'll probably go yellow and you live or die before you get any... <laughs> But garlic, people, we can have garlic in the diet. Right? Like yeah, you know, olive ginger? oil. Huh? Ginger? Ginger? Oh, ginger again, that's got anti-inflammatory and antiviral effects. You know, coconut oil has lovely antibacterial um, effects. So this, you know, food plays a huge part. Like, it's more than calories. I go on and on about this when I'm yeah. writing and people who are following me, like food is information. And some people don't get this, like they still haven't cottoned on to the fact. I love that, that, I love that phrase, food is information. Yeah. yeah, it is, it's information to our bodies. It is talking to us, it's talking to our microbiome, it's educating and impacting the processes in our body. Um, yeah. And we need to rethink about food like that, you know, switching from calories and macros to, you know, to nutrient density and, and getting, you know, a wide variety of foods that will be the building blocks uh, but that will nurture our gut microbiome. Um, and, and so that our body can do what it's brilliant at, which is keep us yeah. cancer free, you know, keep us at a good weight. Like it's, we've got all these mechanisms. We just need to create the right environment to do that. Yeah. Um, so then the other one question is potentially whether it will be longer, we'll see. Um, uh, Basique 1990, your thoughts on a purely black plant based diet, please. I know that we asked, we talked about this on the yes. second podcast, I think, a little bit. I think so. Um, um, so in 21 years of medicine, I would never ever recommend a vegan diet um, for health purposes only. And, um, and, and that would be, that'll be quite a big statement for some people. So just like unpack that for us. So I think, first of all, there's veganism, which is a way of life. And I'm not anti-veganism. Like it's, it's an attitude to life. It's beautiful. I've engaged with some of my vegan friends. It's shaped my thinking. It's made me look at the environment different. You then have the vegan diet, which you don't have to be following veganism to do that, which is solely plant based. And then you've got the vegan food movement and food industry, which I have massive, massive issue with because they are labeling processed factory food as healthy. Um, and I haven't and have an issue with that. Yeah. Now, um, when I'm looking um, with my patients that I'm seeing, what I see in our nation is that we are an obese uh, nation that are malnourished. Like we do not have um uh the the vitamins and minerals and antioxidants on board for our body to function and, 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 the, and the basic macros and we've got the wrong fat balance and and so one of my issues around um the vegan diet is is that i'm really after sort of um, nutrient density so i really want to pack nutrients into people um and a really quick and easy way to do that is to use meat products it's nutrient dense and the thing is with absorbing nutrition like it's not only does that plant have the nutrition in it's also about you know um so so uh, so i am very very pro uh, a plant slant to diet absolutely like 70 percent probably what we should be eating should be a diverse range of plants uh, there's, there's i am wholehearted i think that's it. and i think that's one of the big things uh, a lot of people don't actually eat 
like no. the wide variety. They don't eat the yeah. rainbow. We don't enough. You know, no. I've changed mine over the years. Of, like from when if I go back, not not that many years ago, like mm. my intake of variety of vegetables would yeah. have been abysmal. And yeah. one thing that if one thing about getting the mess the message of getting more more plants and more vegetables into our diet is mm. like is a very positive one to come out of that conversation, no, isn't absolutely. it? Absolutely. And and the key to a, a healthy gut microbiome is having a plant slant to our diet. And and the key to all of our health is a healthy gut, um, without a doubt. So um but um you know I, I do believe that meat has has a place or fish. You could go fish. I, I would be happy if people were just doing fish with a basic, you know, plant slant to their diet um and, and address their fat balance. Um, but yeah, but but I do. But am I worrying? And this is what I see is that you know, for the majority of people who don't understand nutrient density and don't understand their food, they're switching from a processed, shitty, you know, um, standard sort of Western diet to a vegan diet. Um, that again is is highly processed in terms of what is being put on the shelves there. Um, and, and that concerns me, and, and, and so um, that's... The question, the question is more about the quality of the food and like not having the processed foods yeah. and stuff that's not yeah. packed with nutrients yeah. is more of the importance, yeah. I guess, is the thing that I'm hearing yeah. from you. Yeah, and, and I think like, um, so vegans, they can be healthy, like absolutely, but you have to work a lot harder. You have to understand your macronutrients. You have to understand that plant proteins aren't complete proteins. You have to understand where you're going to get some of those other, you know, essential polyunsaturated fats like your EPA and your DHA. You have to understand where you're going to get your B12 from. You have to look at fortified foods and you have to supplement well. So again, on my website, I've, on the resource section, I've got a bit about micronutrients for vegans and protein for vegans because I'm not anti-vegan. I want people to be you know, to live well, and you can do it, but for the majority of people where life is busy, it's a difficult switch. And, yeah. and so, and that's why I, I, I don't advocate for it on, on a whole, um, but, but, but do a number of my patients are vegan, you know, and they really stretch me and challenge me and I have to think and go back to the books and work hard. Um, so, yeah. And, okay. I, and I think from an environmental point of view as well, like, um, you know, they, they bang on about, they, sorry, the vegan movement can, you know, they're advocating for us to look after environment, which, you know, I'm wholehearted about. But I think they've drawn the wrong conclusions that animals are not the problem. It's industrialized farming. And actually, you know, it's also the way that we're producing our crops with monocropping and, you know, herbicides and pesticides and all that. And, and so, but actually my eye is on the regenerative farming movement where they're using animals and they're using techniques that's putting carbon back into the ground and is treating animals well. And we know that the health of those animals and the impact on our health is that they've got better uh, micronutrient profiles and fatty acid profiles and better it's, food. It's back to quality over it is. quantity, isn't it? It is, it is. And, and so... Like people sally the um on your um the, on so on the website drsallybell.com you've got the you've got the information about that that more detail because probably that yes. things that people from vegan diet want to, to yeah. look out to look yeah. out for make sure yeah. that you get things and the vegan society the uk conversation yeah and the vegan society uk is a great resource as well they're sensible they're grounded um, you know, you can now get these EPA and DHA supplements from vegan sources. And so it's, you just really need to get with it if you're going to do that and not just opt to, as a kind of healthy lifestyle. Yeah. So I really, uh, we really recommend, um, yeah, obviously following Sally, if you don't yet, it's on Instagram, it's Dr. Sally Bell, and you can ask her any direct questions on, um, obviously on Instagram, but check out the website, uh, drsallybell.com where you can get those that that detailed information that i think it goes it goes deeper and it's, it's beyond a sort of to and fro conversation about the overall this is what you're thinking and you get to delve into some of those specifics so um recommend people going over to check uh, that out if you're interested in that and i'm sure there's there's a, no, a number of diff other blogs and things that you've written on all of these on all these subjects that we've covered and more um also vakish 1990 says thanks for answering the question Lots of lifts, thanks as well. 
Um, and so from us, Sally, um, yeah. a thank you um, to you for coming on for what we can probably call officially the third time. Um, and I'm sure it won't be the last Welcome either. Back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I'm sure it won't be the last either. So it's great to get that interaction with um, yeah. people's questions live as well as, um, yeah. obviously, you know, we love catching up with you um, anyway. Great, I'm, thank you. I'm going to go and work on my stress to help with, we talked a bit about my thyroid issue, but then the fact that I wake up in the middle of the night is a good, is a good mark. One thing actually, just before we sign off is, you said something to us on the podcast before that was, when something flags up to you that you know is like your body's way of like saying, mm, so there's something out of whack here when you die and you last or something, and actually like sort of taking that as a good thing of going, okay, that's just, that's my body's way of telling me, I'm going to say thank you to my body for that. Yeah. as a marker and I'm going to now do something about yeah. it and that's how I'm going to treat yeah. um, I mean that's how I do it my history is chronic migraine if I get a migraine I go back to my foundations and go okay how's my sleep am I moving am I eating well am I connected you know am I resting well and you just go back to those five things and you do a reset and then your body will reset so it is befriending sometimes you're yeah. being aware of what's going wrong with your body and when it yeah. starts going wrong just come back to those five foundations start putting some things in place and your body will find its reset yeah it's uh it's a great, me like the message of listening to, you know, listening to our bodies and, and being kind to ourselves. And I think that that self-awareness is a message that's come out through a number of these conversations mm -hmm. we've had today with all the different guests. Um, and yeah, this, uh, the, the way that you describe it there of using it being your body's work, because sometimes these things can be stuff that, uh, you know, I get annoyed when I don't have a good night's sleep, but it's, it's as you say, befriending it and actually it's a great attitude, a positive attitude towards it and then encourage us to listen to our buddy and then act positively on the back of it. So it's, it's a lovely message for us to, uh, to finish up on. Good. Great. Lovely to see you. All right. No, thank you so much for joining us. Okay. Bye. Catch you again soon. Cheers. <laughs>